Good morning. Today I'll be speaking about King Asa's tale as covered in part in 2 Chronicles chapter 16. Now as this talk is for the youth, I'll be taking a more light-hearted approach. But first, shall we pray? Father, we commit this time into your hands. Holy Spirit, guide my words to speak truth. And we pray that your message may change our lives for the better. In the holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Now Asa's story is covered in 2 Chronicles chapters 14, 15 and 16, as well as 1 Kings, the part of chapter 15. Asa lived several generations after the divided kingdom. On the left you can see I've also highlighted King Basha, and this is because he will play a part in Asa's tale later on. Now, Asa's character arc can be roughly divided into three portions which I've titled the good, the bad, and the ugly. However, because I've been allocated only 2 Chronicles chapter 16, that leaves me with the bad and the ugly. Nevertheless, let me cover some of the good as described in 2 Chronicles chapters 14 and 15. It can be summarized as Asa smashing the idols and proclaiming loyalty to Yahweh. What I mean by that is, during Asa's time, idol worship and following other gods had taken root in Judah, and Asa initiated reforms to turn worship back to Yahweh. Not only that, in chapter 14, a vast army of Ethiopians and Libyans invades. Judah stands little chance against such an army. But Asa turns to Yahweh and Yahweh responds by defeating this massive army. Now I move on to the bad in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 1 to 5. Asa is again faced by innovation, this time by King Basha of Israel who attacks and starts to build the town of Rama to facilitate his invasion. Instead of turning to Yahweh this time, for some reason, Asa pays off King Ben-Hadad of Syria and reminds him that they are sworn to fight together. As a result, Syria attacks Israel and starts conquering some of their towns. Because of this, Israel has to retreat from Judah and abandons the town of Rama. Judah then uses the materials to build its own towns. So from this map, you can see roughly the layout of the battle. Syria is to the north of Israel and Judah to the south. And if Israel were to fight a war on two fronts, they might be caught in the pincer movement. So once Syria started taking their towns, Naphtali and Dan over there, Israel decided to retreat. Now this might seem to be a resounding victory for Judah. However, Hanani the seer confronts Asa for relying on Syria. Instead of seeking Yahweh as in previous times, he tells Asa, didn't you previously seek Yahweh and didn't Yahweh rescue you from the massive army? As a result, Asa is going to experience wars. But instead of repenting, Asa is stubborn. He imprisons Hanani and he starts being cruel to the people. Boy, that escalated quickly. Now you move on to the ugly, which I've titled because... Asa gets a severe foot disease. Now we don't know what disease, this disease is. It could be gout from eating too much meat. It could be diabetes from eating too much sweet stuff. It could even be an STD because in Jewish culture, sometimes the feet, the word feet is used as a euphemism for the private parts. Regardless, he still wouldn't seek Yahweh. Instead, he relied on his physicians and two years later, he dies. Contrast this to Hezekiah. When God told them that he would die, he turned to God in tears. And because of that, God extended his life by 15 years. Just as a short epilogue, after Asa's time, his son Jehoshaphat also initiates reforms. Now, an interesting thing to note about Asa's story is, as it's covered in 2 Chronicles and 1 Kings, there's a difference because Narrative in Kings only seems to cover the good of Asa's reign, his reforms, and his victory, 
It does not mention Hanane the seer chiding him for relying on Syria, nor does it mention his foot disease and subsequent horrible death. Now, why is this so? Isa seems to be shown in a good light in Kings, but also in a bad light in Chronicles, and this seems to be the opposite of figures like David and Solomon, whose good and bad is shown in Kings, but whose good only is shown in Chronicles. Now, this could be because Chronicles was written in the post exilic period. Perhaps the author wanted to show that when you're surrounded by enemies, as Judah was, you shouldn't seek alliances with foreign nations. Instead, you should turn to Yahweh, who will rescue you. In addition, the way Judah escaped from the attack by Israel is to call Syria to attack Israel. Now, this would run opposite to what the author of Chronicles wants. He looks forward to a, a reunification of the north and the south of all Israel. So perhaps this is the reason the chronicler chooses to focus on Asa's good as well as his bad, so that his bad can be a lesson for the reader on what not to follow. And now, now we come to the part you've all been dreading, the personal application. I don't know why you're clapping, I'm talking about you. Isa's story demonstrates to us that it's not how you start that matters, it's more how you finish. Let me explain. I'll use the examples of King David and King Solomon. Now, David during his life seemed to stumble. He committed adultery with Bathsheba and killed her husband Uriah. And Prophet Nathan confronted him, telling him, You are the man who stands under condemnation. But what did David do? He admitted his sin and repented. And this is why God calls David a man after his own heart. Whereas Solomon started very well, seeking wisdom from God, being allowed to build a temple, but how did he end? His many wives turned into worship of other gods. For Isa himself, he had many chances to repent, to turn to God, but instead, he chose stubbornness. Contrast this again with Saul. He started out persecuting the church very, very bad. But when confronted by Jesus, when he saw a vision of the resurrected Christ, he says that he was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. He was not stubborn. And because of that, he became a Christian and ministered to the Gentiles and suffered greatly for the way. This is the way. This is the way. Dietrich Bonhoeffer summarizes it well. When we die, it's not the end, it's merely the beginning. And this is why it's so important that we end well. This life is just the beginning, the starting point. And how you end, well, that's the beginning of your eternal life to come. Pastor Francis Chan had this uh, red rope illustration. In his own words, You see this red part? This would represent your time on earth. You've got a few short years here on earth, and then you've got all of eternity somewhere else. This is, this is your existence. The Bible teaches that what I do during this little red part determines how I'm going to exist for millions and millions and millions of years forever. All this life, all we go through, is preparing us for eternity. That is why it's important to finish well. When we cross the finish line, the end of our life, there's just the beginning of our eternal life. This is why Paul is so insistent that we keep on running with perseverance. We leave everything behind of this life in order to obtain eternal life. It's why he himself, after everything he'd done for Christ, was still diligent to make sure he himself is not disqualified. And at the end, he could say, he's fought the good fight, He's finished the race, he's kept the faith. He is ending well. 
And in our own walk with Christ, we might stumble, we might fall. But what's important is we get up, we keep on going, we persevere until we reach the finish line. And so let the lesson of King Asa to us be, we may do good in our lives, we may do bad, it might even turn ugly. But in the end, we must turn back to God, we must turn back to Christ so that we can finish well.